we had both come to the city 20 years ago, we would drive around the city looking at abandoned buildings and looking for an opportunity to see uh, if there were any places that could be reimagined. When you're young, you see beauty in things that other people have overlooked. And you're looking for a ledge, you're looking for an opportunity that isn't typical. This particular warehouse had been abandoned, the roof had collapsed, there had been a fire, and the fellow who owned it had passed away. It wasn't for sale. It wasn't for sale it was yet. It just abandoned. It was just abandoned, right? Yeah. The door was just pliable enough that you could kind of press on it and you could see sunlight streaming in where you knew sunlight shouldn't be. At that moment, when you walked in, there was just a collapsed roof and it was full of 30,000 pounds of auto parts. Yeah. Right, so this was the original building and it was just a single room auto electric warehouse. So the cars would pull in right here through this one door. And so this was just a one-man repair shop. So all the demolition, almost all the construction, I did myself, nights and weekends. Um, and this was a challenge. This was three, four years of just weekend labor. It was, it was a self-propelled vision to create a space here within the city and also within the profession. Was it expensive, the building? $40,000. That was 15 years ago. Yeah. And then the renovation was, you know, about $70,000 through a few, few years. In time. In time, time and labor. Time and labor. <laughs> infinite. So the labor infinite was labor. infinite labor, <laughs> limited resources. It was just a, a project that kind of both possessed me and kept going. Of course, I had help with the licensed trades, an electrician or a plumber. You know, we're in the city, so you have to get things permitted and inspected and all that. But you know, everything else, all the demolition and the framing and the finishing and the painting and installation of the skylights. But that's how you have to do it if you really want to become invested in your vision. That's what's fun. The biggest idea, the decision to keep this roofless, was very much tied to one, there's a lot of square footage here. How, how, how do you afford to build back? And what do you, can you afford to build back? And then how do you make this a good place to live? You know, how do you really take advantage of the opportunities that what's here gives you, affords you? It's a room with no windows. They had all been welded shut decades ago. So if you take off the roof, that becomes the one window. You know, it's about a revealing. You figure out what's here, you reveal it, and then you say, oh, that's good, let's leave it there. I mean, it wasn't designed to be exposed to the elements, but it works. Yeah. And what's gone is the wood and the roof. Yeah, that's the cheapest materials couldn't make it. <laughs> they didn't last. So when this is a live space, this would be like a, a, a dining table? This was and still is an outdoor uh, dining area. When I lived here with uh, my wife, we'd pull, pull our cars in here, and it was kind of a, almost like a back gate. You just shut the door to the city, and no one would know you're in here. So you were living in here for a few years? Lived here for a few years, and then uh, Brian and I started our firm, and we moved into the living room. And we started getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. We worked late hours. And then my wife and I said, you know what, it might be nice to have a little home. Live, work, separation. The building has no windows, so if we had solid walls and no skylights, it would be, it would be quite oppressive. So if you imagine the idea of a skylight where you're cutting a hole to the sky, the same attitude was taken with these walls. Instead of having solid walls, we would just have a series of small slivers, and there are these three rooms which filter the, the back from the front. There's a kitchen and a mechanical room and a bathroom. So the idea is that each of these rooms has walls which are fractured or split into segments so that no matter where you are in these rooms from the middle to the back, you can always get views to the courtyard and to the greenery. So kitchen, and then this is a storage room and laundry room, uh, and then the last box with, with the three walls there is the bathroom. So even if we come back here to this, which is now a workspace, but was originally our dining room and living room, 
you get views through the rooms to the courtyard, and you also get natural light above. So we're in the area that was originally the living area as part of live work. This was a, a dining area and a living room and a bedroom back here. But now we're using this area because we've fully occupied it with our office. So it's really a flexible space. And that's the way, the, that's the attitude of the entire building, that it's very adaptable. The, the desire to create spaces that aren't claustrophobic when there are no windows. Well, there's one huge window, right, which is mm. to the courtyard. But glass is expensive. That was driving factor as well as, honestly, cost at the time. So even when you're back here in this workspace or when you're in the restroom, you know, you're getting the presence of, of light through these walls. This is a shower room, so it's a completely wet room. It's tiled up to about six or seven feet with an overhead shower. So it's all meant to get wet, all meant to be dried off. Uh, it's a very compact, you know, bathing, cleaning room. <laughs> Did that work when you were living here? Oh you? yeah, it's yeah. great, yeah. You just shut the door, turn on the shower, it all fills with steam. It's like a single room shower with a toilet in it. <laughs> and the ceiling? It, it's a very straightforward but effective strategy for the ceiling. So these white bar joists that you see, uh, those were here, those were original structure, but the galvanized metallic silvery roof deck is all new. So we had to put that over and the idea was to keep that exposed, don't paint it, and so you're getting a lot of bounced light. So even when we turn on the lights or you're getting sky skylight bouncing off around and off the floor, it feels very reflective at the ceiling plane. Often in these types of spaces, they'll paint out the top ceiling zone dark so you're not looking at all the ductwork and all that. The strategy here was to expose it to keep it very reflective, and that increases the, the sense of lightness in the space. You don't feel like there's no windows in here. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah. we worked hard to tune the, the type of glass. We have reflective screens over each one. The screens that are on there are a metallicized screens, so they're filtering not just light, but also solar heat gain. They're bouncing that energy back up through the skylight. So the light is filtered. It's very uniform, it's general, and it's, it's not hot light. The name Villa de Murph comes from the idea that you create a place to go to, an, an oasis of sorts, but it's not anti-urban. It's within an urban condition. Now you're going to hear our neighbor, our friendly neighbor, the train. And the great thing is, is that we're close to everything. We walk out through the doors and then we're five minutes away from where we need to be. So we're at this great crossroads. As you look out past the train, we've got a city street, two lanes. We've got three trunk lines for Norfolk Southern Railroad, which run from Florida, from the Gulf, all the way up to the Northeast. They run right through Atlanta. Atlanta's a railroad town. Beyond that, you have a four-lane state highway. And beyond that, you have MARTA, which is our city's public transportation. And then you have another city street. So we've got like 14 lanes of traffic right outside of our front doors, very active. That's the old sign, and we like to keep that sign empty. It's like a plan of the courtyard. It's just four walls, and then it's empty with no roof. So. It makes a statement. Yeah, it does, doesn't make it. Yeah, nothing here. Keep moving. <laughs> keep moving along, people. Nothing to see. There's a very strategic approach in this project, which is that it's anonymous from the outside. So the facade is very much neutral. There are no windows here, and no one knows that we're here, and that's on purpose. So it's in the heart of the city, but it's also a bit of an oasis. There's not kind of like a, a nostalgic or romanticized vision of decay or of things that are overlooked. There's kind of an opportunistic and also practical approach to it. This will work. You kind of like what's possible. It's enough to get started. And if you take that approach and then you're also looking for a way to see the world that maybe others haven't, you know, leaving the roof off or having a wall of glass or having rooms which are split open, those kind of two things mixed together give you some purchase. I think having done this project has definitely informed our practice. It definitely teaches us that beauty can be found in a lot of places. 
even though our practice is evolving and getting much larger, we still have an understanding that what you find on a site in the existing context has value and you can leverage it. You can't always tear down and start over. It's a tremendous you know, abuse of our resources. It doesn't make sense. So if we can change our expectations, I think we can get a lot further with how we build our environment rather than always impose an ideal through tearing down and building from scratch. It's no different than a city that's been around for 600 years, is that you find ways to reuse structures, and you discover what you can and you turn it into something new. It's a very natural approach to things. I think what's interesting is that it can lead to unexpected situations. Beauty can be found in a lot of places.